Just freezes up in those times. We're gonna give it a shot this morning. Um, 
On the very end, playing piano, is Raynell Matthews. It almost happened right then. I know Raynell really well. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Dave Drewy, and this is Caroline Dedman. This is Steve Thompson, Don Gibson, and Bill Craw playing saxophone for us this morning. <laughs> My name is Bobby Mason. I'm one of the pastors here at Mountain Bible Church. Now you know us a little bit. Why don't you turn to somebody next to you, shake a hand, and tell them, welcome to Mountain Bible Church. church family. Good morning, good morning. If you guys want to take a seat. So good to see everybody here this morning. If you are a first time guest with us, thank you for joining us. We would love to get to know more about you. There's a connection card in the seat back in the seat in front of you. If you could just fill that out. And we have a welcome kiosk outside where the ladies have a whole bunch of information about Mountain Bible, all the ministries that are going on here, different events. So you can take it out there and um, just find out some more information about us. We also have our website, we have our Facebook page, and we have the wonderful bulletin that you guys all have in your hand to read with everything going on here. So welcome this morning. My name is Felicia Moore. I am your children's pastor. And I am super excited for this time of the year because we get to get ready for Harvest Block Party. Yay! <laughs> for those of you who, who are new and do not know what Harvest Block Party is, it is our all-church outreach that we do for our community on October 31st. We open up our whole campus. We provide a free dinner. We have around 28 game booths here. We have so much fun. You get to be a kid again, dress up, hand out candy, play games. What that requires is over 200 people to make that night happen for our community. We get about 1,000 to 1,200 people that come through here, so it's a great night, um, but we need help. So today, after second service, I'm gonna have a uh, short meeting in Kids Town where you can come and find out more information and sign up to run a booth, um, help with the dinner, or um, actually there's setup, clean up, a lot of different things that take place at night. So um, just come and see me after second service, um, and definitely start bringing that candy. It takes 900 pounds of candy to make that night happen. Yes, the dentists love us this time of the year. She probably um, bring a thousand pounds. Huh? Probably bring a thousand because Billy usually gets into That's it. That's right. Enough. And make sure it's Heath bars. We need the Heath bars. <laughs> For, for Billy and Pastor Dave, actually. <laughs> um, and then, if you guys want to know information um, about Mountain Bible, today we have our membership class from 3 to 5 in Building C with Pastor Craig. If you want to become a member here or just want to just know, you know, what do we believe, all the information about Mountain Bible, definitely show up today and um, hang out with Pastor Craig and get to know who we are. And this time, I will pray. Father God, you are faithful to us each and every day. You are good. So grateful, Lord, that you are there in the midst of a storm. You are our calm. You are our strength when we are tired. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for loving us so much each and every day. Lord, I pray for Billy today as he comes up and gives a message. Let all of our hearts be wide open to what you want us to hear. And let this week be filled with glory to you by our words and our actions. We thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over Thank you. 
stones they wait for spring
Bye. 
Father, thank you. Not only can we count on you no matter what, you're not just a friend who's there. You're a friend who has all the power in the universe, and you are worthy of all glory and praise this morning, God. Yes. So I pray for the message this morning, Father, that you would speak in a mighty way through Billy. Your spirit would be strong in this place. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, good morning. Great to be with you guys this morning. Uh, I just have to say, I don't want to eat all the candy, okay? If there happens to be a rip in the bag and a few pieces fall out, I might, you know, take care of those. Uh, I do discriminate, so um, don't be bringing those bottle caps and Smarties and that kind of, you know, those, those are like the junk bags. Don't be bringing those. We want chocolate. That's what we want. We want to bring the chocolate. We want the, uh, the, the Almond Joys specifically. Those are, those are all right. Uh, I'm just going to say Pastor Dave likes the Heath Bars. So I'm just going to throw that out there. Bobby just likes to brag because Bobby doesn't like sweets. Bobby likes breakfast burritos and, uh, and beef jerky and, and roasted nuts and that kind of stuff. So if that was around, Bobby would be digging in, I promise you. Well, we are in our second study in the book of Acts. Super excited to be studying through this book. Excited about what God has. Exodus, thank you. Thank you. We're in that book right there. Exodus. Interesting. That's not our passage. That's okay. We'll, get, we'll, be, we'll be all right. We'll be all right. Um, so... As a matter of fact, I kind of wish that was our passage because, um, at least the Hebrews 11 part, because Hebrews 11 is a, has some amazing cross-references to our passage. We're going to be in chapter 2 this morning, uh, to our passage this morning, but as Dave and I, Dave and I, mostly Dave, uh, put the outline together, this morning we're going to be in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, okay? Okay. Uh, Exodus chapters, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. My wife's gone, guys. You know, it's, it's a hard weekend. Got a lot of ladies at Camp Ruffett. As a matter of fact, if you and I are talking after the service, I'm not kidding, remind me to go home and pick up my kids between services and bring them to church because they have no other way of getting here. Because I do have a driving son. He's gone. It's a long story. Um, so the deal is, these first 10 verses would really, I would love to reference the Hebrews passage. But I, I was planning on going that route, and Dave said, you're not referencing the Hebrews passage, are you? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, oh, well, that's kind of, kind of, that's going to kind of step on my toes next week. And so I'll leave it for Dave. So Dave taught us through the first chapter last week, and uh, we saw that the, the Israelites are there in Egypt. They, they began there, if you know the story, they began there by invitation. They were, they were brought there um, by Joseph and at the invitation of, of that, that Pharaoh at that time. But now they've been there for a very long time. They've, they've grown, in, they've become mighty, they've grown in number. And the new Pharaoh is very concerned about them and about their influence and power in the nation. And so he begins to oppress them. He begins to, to bring down labor, harsh labor upon them. They basically have become slaves in the land. And, and that wasn't really solving the problem. And so Pharaoh decreed that that all of the young Hebrew boys or, or Hebrew babies that were being born were to be killed, they were put, to be put to death. That wasn't working. They were still Hebrew, uh, I'm sorry, sons being born. And so uh, he calls the midwives in and he says, what's the deal? I told you that, that all of the Hebrew boys that are being born are to be put to death. And they said, well, you know, the Hebrew ladies are just, they just have the babies before we can even get there. And and uh, there's not much we can do. And so then he changes the decree and he says, okay, if there's a Hebrew boy that is born before you can arrive and take care of it, I need you to throw it into the river. That was the decree 
of Pharaoh. That is the atmosphere that God's people were living in at this point in time. And so that brings us to Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. It says that a man of the house of Levi went and took as wife, as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. She hid him three months. Now, we don't know if Pharaoh's decree concerning the male children had already gone out before uh, Moses' parents conceived him or not. But what we do know from chapter one is that many of the Hebrew boys, as I just said, were still being born. The, the Hebrew people were continuing to conceive children. And, and I'm sure that there were some who were, um, you know, concerned about that. And, and what if it's a boy and not a girl and, and all of that kind of thing. But they continued to have children. They continued to thrive. And I imagine that this must have been a very difficult thing for the, for the pregnant women to, to sort of manage the emotions, right? Because as in almost all cases, a pregnancy is an exciting thing. It's something that, that, that we're looking forward to, that's, that's, a, that's cause for celebration. But at the same time, Imagine the turmoil that they must have been experiencing once this decree went forth. They must have just been wrestling with the the excitement, but then also the fear and the unknown and and, and the stress and the anxiety that would come with all of that kind of thing. And you'd think they they would have done all they could to to make sure they they no longer conceived. You'd think that, that this decree of Pharaoh would have the intended effect of diminishing the people, of causing them to sort of shrink back and decrease in number and and become weaker and weaker. But instead, the opposite was the case. They continued to have children. They continued to thrive. I'm sure there were some that maybe out of fear uh, were, were doing that way they could not to conceive children. But many continued building families and they were growing and they were becoming stronger despite the the harsh world that these children were being brought into. Even if it wasn't a, a male child that was to be put to death, it's still a child being born into slavery. It's still a child being born into a, a harsh reality in many ways. And as I thought about this, I thought about how I've heard, I don't know if, the, if many is, is accurate, but I've heard some young individuals in the last several years talk about, you know, I'm not sure I want to bring a child into this world. I'm not sure that I, I, I feel like this is something I, I want to do, that, that I, I don't know that I see the future is looking bright or the future is looking good. And I'm just not sure I want to have kids in, in this, the, the current state of our world. And so many are choosing not to have children for various reasons, but that's a factor that's playing into that decision. It's more and more com- common for couples just to choose to say, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I just, I'm not, it seems like it used to be sort of just the understood path. When you get married, then you're, you're probably going to start a family and you're probably going to kind of follow that trajectory. But that's becoming less and less the norm, less and less uh, common or, or, or uh, something that you can, you can count on. And so when I was reading through this passage, I just kind of found myself wondering, why did the Hebrews continue to have kids? Why do they continue to, to have children in this, their, their current culture, in their current circumstances? And there's probably a, a, a longer, maybe more nuanced answer to that question. But I believe that the, the primary reason is because they believe that children were a blessing from God. And they believed, based on God's first commandment, to a husband and wife that's listed in the scriptures, that their call 
was to have children. It was part of their, their, their service to the Lord. Part of their obedience to God was to have children. As the Lord said, God blessed them, this is in Genesis 1, and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. They believed that, that children were, were a sign of blessing and they believed that this was part of their worship to the Lord as their God. Now, I know that there are a myriad of reasons why some individuals, some couples choose not to have children. So I'm not speaking to everybody whatsoever. I know there are medical reasons. There are all sorts of reasons why people do not have children. But as a culture, we are, there is a shift that's taken place that's, that's causing less excitement about children in young couples it's causing couples not to, to, to feel comfortable about bringing kids into our worlds. And I think there are many, the future just looks so bleak. You know, sometimes that's the conversation that's, that's had often. And so as a younger person, imagine, you know, you're having these conversations with the generations be, that, are, that are in front of you. And they're, they're always pointing to the negatives of the future or, or what's, what's happening or what's coming, that would be a discouragement, I would say, to having kids. But the reality is, if we're still here, then God's calling us to fully be here. He's calling us to fully inhabit this life and this, this world. We are in the world, we're not of the world, but sometimes we can kind of get this mentality of sort of hunkering down and just kind of waiting out until the Lord saves us, until the Lord rescues us out, whether it's through death or the, the rapture of the church or whatever our, our viewpoint is. Sometimes we can kind of get into this, this mentality that, oh, you know, this world is already kind of lost. It's already kind of gone. It's, it's, gone, it's going to hell in a handbasket. And so I'm just going to kind of hunker down and kind of, you know, isolate, insulate and wait it out. But that's not what God's called us to. God's called us to be in the world, not of it, but in it, fully in it, living in it, and contributing to our community in every way that we can, and being salt and being lights where he's placed us. When the Israelites were carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon, they were taken captive. Now, they knew it was only going to be 70 years. They, the, the, the Lord, through his prophets, had told them this will be a 70-year captivity. It was a period of correction for their sin and rebellion against God. And so they had chosen, okay, well, if, if that's how it's going to be, this, in, in this wicked world, this wicked culture, we're just going to kind of hunker down and just kind of just kind of wait it out. But the Lord said, no, don't do that. The Lord commanded them through the prophet Jeremiah in the, the famous chapter, Jeremiah 29. He says, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. I believe that's the same call, same heart of God for us today and through every generation. He's saying, hey, you may be in a hostile land. You may be in a, a tough place. You may not see all of the, the brightness of the future, but I want you to be there. I want you to plant roots. I want you to, I want you to, to, to pray for the community that you find yourself in. I want you to plant gardens and start businesses and build houses and have kids and, and for your kids to have kids and find wives for your sons and, and husbands for your daughters. I want you to be fully part of it. 
so that, and pray that it will prosper. And if it prospers, then you will prosper. That's God's heart. I love the, the resilience that we see in the Israelites. Even today, we, the, the people of Israel, they've, they've largely rejected their Messiah. I believe that God's word tells us there is a future plan for them, for their eyes to be open to Jesus as their savior. But even today, that, that same resilient spirit continues. It's, it's pretty impressive in, in many ways. They've always been an oppressed people. They've always been a tiny little little minority group in the, the world. And they've always been a, a target. And yet they, they just persist and they persist and they persist. And, and when rockets come into their land and, 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 and uh, places are bombed, it's a common practice for them not to flee from that area. But as soon as the, the, the police will allow them, they go back to that area and they, and they do business in those areas because they want the enemy to know you cannot stop us. We will not back down. We will not be afraid. And that's the heart that God's called you and I to have. God's called us to a, a, a heart that is, that is brave and a, and a constitution that is strong. He's called us to be those people that, that, have, that are optimistic about the future and say, I don't care what's coming at me. I don't care what I, I maybe perceive to be down the road. I am going to trust the Lord and I'm going to keep my head up and I'm going to keep going. That's what God's called us to. I believe that. And we see that in Moses' family in this passage. Look at verses three and four. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. The baby had gotten to the point where they could no longer hide him. He was crying, he was making noises, he was loud. It, was, it had gotten to the point where it was dangerous for him to remain in the home. Can you imagine that? I mean, imagine you've got this beautiful baby boy. We're told he was a beautiful baby. You've got this beautiful baby boy in your home. You love him so much with all of your heart. You're so excited about him. You're so blessed by him. But at the same time, that little baby boy is sort of a death sentence for your family. Can you imagine the conversations that they had to be having as week after week went by, month after month went by, the conversations they, they had to have had about what are we gonna do? We can't hide him forever. We can't keep this, this baby concealed for much longer. What are we gonna do? And so his mom, with her own hands, began to make fashion a little basket to float and to begin to put pitch and everything on, on the outside to make it waterproof and all of that kind of thing. Can you imagine doing that? Creating that little, that little basket, that little boat, knowing what its intention was? Can you imagine that? I can't imagine it. Can you imagine then actually taking your three-month-old and placing it inside of the basket and carrying it to the river and placing it in the reeds there on the edge of the river and letting go? I can't imagine it. I can't imagine what they had to do. Now you may be thinking, well, how could she do it? I would have fought with all my, with every, all my strength, with everything I had in me. I would have fought. There's, not, there's no way I would have done that kind of thing. But, but you have to realize, we know she had two other children that were older, probably born before Pharaoh's decree. She had to care for, look out for. And that if they kept Moses, it, it was a death sentence for everyone in the family. There was no easy answer. There was no, there were, there was no uh, 
clear solution to this situation. She had no choice but to let him go and entrust him completely to the Lord. What, a, what an amazing example of, of faith. She had to do something. And so she, I believe, just entrusting, just entrusted him to the Lord and just said, okay, Lord, I'm gonna do everything I can do here and I'm gonna entrust my child, the most precious thing in my life, into your hands, to you. Believing that you are good, believing that you're gonna do something to take care of him. Maybe you've had to let go of something valuable in your life. Maybe you in some way have had to, had to, had to let go of something that was precious to you, actually opening your hands and saying, okay, I don't, I, this, is, this is heartbreaking for me. This is the hardest thing I've ever done, but okay, I will let go. I will entrust this thing that's precious to me to you, Lord. It's scary. It's a hard thing to do. It's scary to fully surrender to him, but that's exactly what God's called us to do. He's called us to a life of surrender, of open-handedness before him. To be able to say to him, Lord, all that I have is entrusted to you. We feel like we have control. We feel like we have control. Uh, like we can kind of dictate where our life goes or what we do with the things that we have in our possession or our stewardship. But the reality is there are many, many things out of our control. And we're called to say, Lord, I lay, them all, I lay it all at your feet, even my children. I lay it all at your feet, God, and I entrust them to you. Jesus said many times that in order for us to gain true life, that is, as Pastor Dave calls it, life with a capital L, the abundant life that God has called us to, that we must lose our lives for his sake in order to gain life. And and for me, the, the, the picture, whenever I read about losing my life, laying down my life for for his namesake, I picture opening my hands and releasing whatever it is that I'm grabbing so tightly to, whether it's my reputation or my ego or my success or my plan or my finances or my kids or my whatever it is. It's, it's a loosening, loosening of the grip and opening of the hands and saying, Lord, it's yours. It's all yours. Have you done that? If you've come to Christ, you've done that. You've done that. You've you've said, oh, Lord, I recognize that that my self-reliance is getting me nowhere. I recognize that my own righteousness is is a mess. I recognize that my own efforts are are not gonna measure up. Lord, I need a savior. I'm drowning. And you place your faith in Jesus. You see Jesus, the Savior. You place your faith in Jesus. That's an opening of the hands. That's an opening of the heart and saying, God, you're the answer. You're the key for me. But then if you've walked with the Lord for any period of time, you know we take it back. We take this back, we take that back, we take this back, we take that back. It's a daily thing, isn't it? It's a daily decision to say back to the Lord over and over and over again, okay, Lord, I, I lay it at your feet. Okay, Lord, I lay it at your feet. Oh, yeah, I, I recognize, Holy Spirit, that you're, you're pinpointing that thing that I've grabbed back onto. And so I'm, I choose obedience again today to say, okay, I trust you with it, God, my business my health, whatever it is, I trust you with it today again, Lord. It's a daily decision. The only way to truly live and thrive is to have open hearts and hands with the Lord. 
so that, you, so that we have the attitude that says, God, you can put in whatever, whatever you see fit and you can take out whatever you see fit. That's the only way to live a life that's really thriving with the Lord. Otherwise, it's just sort of this constant push and pull. It's this constant sort of dance that we do, trying to kind of keep closets in our lives shut and away from the Lord and separated from our, our walk with Christ. And, and it's, it all just sort of robs us of joy. The only way to truly experience what he desires for us is to say, have your way, Lord. Have your way. I trust you. And so what happened to Moses as his sister looked on from a distance, verses five and six? Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby wept. So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Amazing. <laughs> Moses is found by one of the, very, the, the, the family members of the very family who has sentenced, sentenced him to death. The very family, that's, that's the, the reason that he's in the, the reeds and the river in the first place is the one that, is, that he is found by. Surely she had been conditioned to hate the Hebrews. Pharaoh's daughter, she'd been conditioned to reject the Hebrews, to vilify the Hebrews. But she opened that basket and the baby cried and her heart melted and she had compassion on him. My wife has a bookmark that says, babies are such a nice way to start people. <laughs> and it's true. Right? If, if, if they just came along as teenagers, it'd be a whole different situation. I mean, those of you who, who foster and adopt teenagers, man, praise God for you. They show up as babies, right? They have these giant eyes and these huge heads, and they're just so squishy, and, and you know, they just seem so perfect and innocent, and, and you just kind of can't help but love them and be, be drawn to them. The Lord knows what He's doing. And isn't it often the case that we can hold prejudices against sort of ambiguous groups, right? We can hold prejudices against groups of people. But when, we're, when we come face to face with an individual of that group, it's a different story so often. You know, you may think, oh yeah, those people, that group, he's one of them, she's one of them. But then when you actually interact with them individually, you go, oh, they're just people. They're just like me. You know, I'd always heard that the French people, if you're French, I apologize. Um, I've, I've always heard that the French were rude. I, I, has anybody ever heard that before? Have you heard that the French are rude? So we went to France kind of expecting them to be rude to us. The reality is we had a wonderful experience with everybody that we interacted with in France. I mean, it was, it was amazing. We were, we were in the train station first time. I've talked about Europe a lot lately. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm hankering for a Europe trip. Um, but we were, we were in France in the train station and we're trying to figure out the ticket, how to get the tickets, but it's all in French, of course, and I'm a typical American and I don't speak another language. And so we're just kind of bumbling through, bumbling through. And this lady, she is just super well-dressed. She just looks so dignified. And she comes along, the kind of person that you might, you might think would just look down her nose at, at, at sloppy Americans that don't speak another language. And she just walks up with a big smile and she says in French, I assume that this is what she was saying, something to the effect of, it looks like you're having trouble. May I help you? And so we just kind of went, uh-huh. And, and we gave her our money and she got us our tickets and we went on our way. We had those kinds of experiences all, the, all along in France. And it, it totally changed my viewpoint of French people because I actually met some. I actually interacted with a few. And that's so often the case, I believe. 
And look at verse 7. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. And so the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, Because I drew him out of the water. I love the the cleverness of Miriam, we know this is Moses' uh, sister Miriam of, of Miriam. She's just watching. Miriam is not just is not defeated. She's not like, oh, well, this is just the worst tragedy that's ever happened, and and I just no, nothing good can come out of this, and I you know I'm just I'm just going to quit, and you know, no, she was she was intently watching her brother, keeping an eye on her brother. She was fixed on her brother, and she was thinking, is there some way I can help him? Is there some way that I can, I can be a part of this story for, for good? And, and, and so as she saw Pharaoh's daughter open that basket and see that baby, she, she was right there. And she said, hey, would you like me to call one of the, the nursing uh, Hebrew mothers to take care of him, to nurse him? And sure enough, Pharaoh's daughter says, yeah, that's a great, or, that's a great idea. Why don't you do that? I love that. She's just clever. She's, she's just, she's resourceful. She's just, she's not giving up. I coach soccer, coach high school soccer. And uh, man, this is one of the, the, the things that we, we are harping on all the time. Never give up on the ball. Never give up on the ball. Never assume that <clears throat> the worst is going to happen. Never assume the goalkeeper of the other team is going to, is, when you take your shot, is actually going to grab the ball and hang on to it. You follow that ball. You stay with it until there's no, there's no chance. If you lose the ball, you get on it. You stay on them until there's no chance. I love the, the heart here because letting go and surrendering to the Lord doesn't mean that we just kind of sit back and go, well, I have no part to play. There's nothing for me to do here. That's not what it means. We can, we can still surrender and let go and use all of our resourcefulness and all of our initiative and all of our cleverness and, and, and all of our wits. The letting go and the surrender is, is trusting God and leaving the results to him. That's what it is. Trusting God and leaving the results to him. It doesn't mean we don't get after it. It doesn't mean we're not busy. It doesn't mean we're not working hard. It doesn't mean we're not, we're not giving everything we have. And I think we see that in Miriam in this. Only God can bring about such an amazing turn of events. Moses being saved by the very family who wanted him killed and his mother being the very one that's called to take care of him. And, and in that culture and in that time, they would nurse for a very long time. And so she probably had him for at least for five years, maybe even six years, raising her son, teaching her son in the ways of the Lord, pouring into him, shaping his character. And yes, she did eventually have to give him up still entrusting him to the the protection of the Lord. But she got paid also to take care of her son. How many moms get paid to take care of their kids? That doesn't happen very often, right? Only God can do this. God rewarded them for trusting him with Moses when they were hiding him and then for trusting him with Moses when they had to let him go. God rewarded their faithfulness. God doesn't protect us, as I said the last time I taught, and we know this, we're aware of this. Because God is good and loving and righteous and right, he doesn't protect us from everything because he's allowed us to live our lives. He's given us free will. And that free will has resulted in a broken world. A world that is, that is ravaged in many ways by sin, a world that, that, that is full of adversity because of that sin, that the choices of all of us collectively. But God, that's the title of my message this morning, but God. And if you've read through the scriptures, you know that that little phrase is throughout the Bible. 
The, the, the circumstance, the situation is stated, and then the phrase is given, but God. Because without him, there really is very little hope. But with him, we have all the hope in the world. All the hope in the world. But God brings hope when we can't see the way through. But God means ashes aren't the end of your story. But God means that, that though it's an impossible situation, we have a God that is supreme over all things and can do anything in any situation. I love it. The greatest of the but God truths is clearly communicated in Paul's letter to the Ephesian church when he says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God being rich in his mercy because of the great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when our backs were turned to him and we wanted nothing to do with him, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. But God, with Christ, with the Lord, we need to be those resilient ones filled with hope, filled with optimism, saying, as long as we're here on this earth, God is doing good things in and through our lives. God has good plans in store for you and for me. That's a fact. He will turn all things together, work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. These are promises. And Paul says in Romans, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of which shall be revealed in us. But God, open your hands, open your hearts, and you step into a whole new economy, a whole new kingdom with all new possibilities that apart from him, they're just not available. They're just not there. Amen? Amen. Well, Lord, we... We do face many adversities, Lord. We do face many trials, God. We, we do look at the world and the state of things and we can see darkness and we can see trouble. But when our eyes are lifted off of the waves of the storm and they're fixed on you, we see a whole different future. We see a whole different situation because the God who is sovereign over all, who has all of the authority and all of the power is truly a good God, a loving God, a righteous God. And we are so relieved by those truths, Lord. We are so relieved by that, God that we can trust you because you're good, because you love us, because you're kind, Lord. We trust you. We open our hands and we open our hearts to you today. And we thank you that you have made a way through. You've made a way out. You've made a way for us that we may have the assurance of heaven for all eternity through your son, Jesus. Thank you for that, Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and let's worship the Lord together. Oh, great a chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could Oh, uh-huh.
darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Oh, Jesus Christ, my